I'm very happy to greet you this afternoon on behalf of Harvard Kennedy School and particularly the program on crisis leadership. Um, we're here today, I believe, uh, first of all, out of deep sympathy and empathy with the people of Japan, uh, some of whom have uh, died uh, or been injured, some of whom have lost their homes, uh, their livelihoods, um, or they have been less directly affected but have seen their families uh, uh, hurt, uh, have uh, experienced the sadness of this very uh, difficult event. I think we are also here, though, because uh, in the United States we've watched the television uh, images of what happened in Japan, the uh, damage of the earthquakes, the horrendous video of the tsunami, and the frightening pictures of the nuclear plant, and we've wondered exactly what has been happening. Uh, we get some idea of that from reading the newspapers or seeing commentary on television, uh, but perhaps that is not as satisfying as we would like it to be to understand the significance uh, and some of the deeper meaning of, of what's occurring. Uh, we also are, uh, not only are we interested in the physical damage and the uh, potential damage from the reactor failures, but we are also concerned about the impacts on the Japanese people. What does this mean? for them emotionally and psychologically. And finally, I think some of us are interested in the larger significance of this event, uh, because this is by no means the only uh, awful natural disaster that has occurred in recent years. We only have to look at the earthquakes in Haiti and Chile last year, uh, the Wenchuan earthquake uh, in China in 2008, uh, Cyclone uh, Nargis in uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, in the same year, uh, the Asian tsunami in 2004, to see uh, the impacts of enormous uh, uh, events of this sort. And the question is, why do these have such a large effect on human society? Uh, why do they seem to be happening more <coughs> frequently? Um, and what are some of the things we can think about looking forward to uh, emergencies that are not, that cascade with their impacts uh, sometimes multiple physical impacts and certainly economic, social, psychological impacts um, on the societies in which they occur and perhaps on the world as a whole. I think we're very fortunate today to have a, an excellent panel uh, to comment on these su subjects from several different perspectives. And let me introduce them briefly, um, more briefly than uh, I could, um, uh, in the order that they're going to speak. Uh, and I should say, by the way, we've asked each panelist to speak uh, no more than 10 or 12 minutes uh, so that we'll leave ample time for questions and answers. And I know that each panelist is holding back some things that they would say if they had more time that hopefully will come out in the question and answer period. So let me introduce them. First, we have Jun Kurihara, who is a Japanese economist uh, who has been a senior fellow here at the Kennedy School since 2003. Uh, he's currently affiliated with the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation, but simultaneously in Japan, he is the research director of the Canon Institute for Global Studies and serves as a liaison officer of the Research Institute of Economy, Trade, and Industry. He has a faculty position uh, at a Japanese university, and he's written a number of papers about um, various economic issues confronting uh, Japan and has been working recently on research, even before this event, um, about the uh, disaster preparedness of the nuclear industry in Japan. Uh, professor Michael Golay uh, from MIT is a professor of <coughs> nuclear science and engineering, where he's been a faculty, he's been associated with the university since 1971. Uh, he's director of the reactor technology course for utility executives uh, and the risk-informed operational decision management course um, both co-sponsored by MIT and the National Academy for Nuclear Training. And most recently, he's focused his research and teaching um, upon improving nuclear power performance, both in the United States and internationally. Uh, Professor uh, Shoji Sushida uh, is an expert in risk and social psychology. Uh, he's been a professor at Japan's Kansai University since 1997, and I should say just arrived in the United States from Japan uh, on Sunday evening. Um, he has served as Deputy Vice President of the University as well as Vice Dean of both its Graduate School of Psychology and the Faculty of Safety Science, uh, where he's now based. 
Um, and finally, um, my co-director of the program on crisis leadership and my uh, excellent colleague of many years, Dutch Leonard. Um, Dutch is the uh, uh, George F. Baker Professor of Public Management at Harvard Kennedy School and the Elliot Snyder and Family Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. Um, you can usually find him walking on the Anderson Bridge in one direction or another. Um, he teaches leadership, organizational strategy, crisis management, and financial management. Um, we chair together a number of executive education programs on crisis leadership. Um, and uh, so I would like to uh, uh, welcome all of our panelists today, uh, thank them for participating, caution them that I will try to be a reasonably aggressive uh, moderator and uh, let you know when the time is elapsing and see if we can preserve the question time for the audience. So let me call on Jun Kuri. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jun Kuri Hara. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I would like to share with you uh, my observations uh, um, uh, uh, that are uh, hastily uh, collected based on uh, informa patchy information uh, in the beautiful country of Japan. I would like to speak to uh, for the think of uh, the people over there. Okay. Today I would like to talk about uh, the uh, tentative assessment of the Tohoku Pacific uh, Ocean earthquake. This is the name of uh, uh, earthquake. And uh, first, I'll touch on uh, uh, disaster diagnosis, and secondly, uh, di uh, disaster responses, and uh, that are. Uh, uh, implemented amidst this uh, cascading uh, disasters. And the third, uh, I'll touch on the nuclear power plant uh, disaster management. And finally, I will share with you my tentative uh, uh, evaluations. This is a uh, uh, global, you have seen that uh, the uh, map uh, carried by London Economist on March 5th, uh, 11th. This conveys a portion of uh, the truth. The truth is this. Uh, between March 10th and 16th, the number of earthquakes are in total, uh, the huge number of uh, the huge earthquake is 47. The, uh, um, uh, the earthquakes uh, uh, which, uh, whose uh, magnitude is larger than 6 to uh, uh, six, seven, and uh, um, four out of which are uh, uh, magnitude seven. And this is uh, the, some sort of a uh, uh, representative uh, huge earthquake that took place during that time. As you can see, from uh, uh, northern part of Japan to uh, the middle of uh, Japan, there are a lot of uh, the uh, there are a lot of uh, the earthquake centering on around here. Sandiku Coast here, and Fukushima is here. And uh, the interesting uh, point of view is lethal danger is not quakes. Japan is Japan has a high a strict a strict building standard, which is very robust against quakes. But tsunami is really dangerous, so that uh, all nuclear power plant with stood quakes, but merciful, uh, merciless tsunamis toyed with a pile of containers and jet fighters of Japan's self-defense force and ships and residential areas. So that you, you can see the, how dreadfully strong the tsunami power had. And then followed by lack of electricity, fund, uh, fuels, and waters, and, and everything. So I pick up the uh, number of uh, the uh, blackouts in Tokyo electric areas. Four million houses suffered a blackout just after the earthquake. And hard hit area, Tohoku Electric, also reported 4.4 million houses suffered uh, uh, the Blackout, but uh, like in the meantime, the Tokyo Electric quickly reduced the number of houses suffering blackout. But 
東北エレクトリック took some years or some days to retreat or、uh, say recover the,、uh, the condition. And this is the number of uh, 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 people who passed away or missing, injured, or isolated in inaccessible areas or evacuees. As the day goes by,、uh, they, oh, the, the, the number is increased. At the same time, our spreading fears of nuclear disaster is right. As you know, they actually, we are very conscious about that. Right now, the Fukushima、uh, Daiichi, the first nuclear power, nuclear power plant,、uh, is right now suffering some sort of、uh, dangerous radiation. And this is Tokyo and Narita Airport. Right now, although actually I'm not a specialist of、uh, Uh, radiation, but that's like so far so good uh, that we, uh, they, they are, they, well, they are、uh, say, safely control the、uh, emission of radiation,、uh, let's say,、uh, the controlled radiation. And let's look at the timeline of the first two hours. Just after the earthquake, Nucle Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency. This is the Japanese counterpart of NRC,、uh, established、uh, emergency headquarters, and then fired the disaster management agency、uh, through a satellite warning system, warned seven, 37 local governments against the huge tsunamis. And one minute later, Prime Minister of the official residence set up an emergency team, and in the middle of、uh, quakes and the tsunamis, Central Disaster Management Council was established. And the Bank of Japan set up a disaster management team to control free,、uh, they make free flow of money, or say, stable. And then,、uh, 14 minutes later, Prime Minister orders Japan's、uh, self defense forces to make a maximum effort. And then, 40 minutes later, Tokyo Electric、uh, power company TEPCO makes first、uh, announcement. So far, so good. But after that, something wrong with the nuclear power plant, and the next, uh, the, 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 the final part of two hours was the beginning of ordeal of, for the workers at the nuclear power plant, people, and the fear and anxiety for the, world of,、uh, for the people of the world. And let's trace the events、uh, at the nuclear power plant. This is the, the Pacific Ocean. The earthquake took place, but at the same time, as you can see, they are after, but they after、uh, shocks and tsunamis. Interestingly, the、uh, nuclear power plant very closest to the epicenter of、uh, the Onagawa NPP was in,、uh, remained intact. But unfortunately, Tepco Fukushima Daiichi, the first nuclear power plant, and the second one hit.、Uh, Received a lot of damage from、uh, uh, the tsunami. This is the aerial view of、uh, uh, Fukushima da Daiichi. And uh, the, as, you, as you have seen, the, at 3 42, all the electricity was cut off. In three hours later, Prime Minister,、uh, uh, uh, nuclear emergency was established, evacuation. Tem And Fukushima 2 also suffered a lot of problems and the vacation. And they, this is a, a series of、uh, events. And my evaluation as for nuclear disaster management the difficulty of predicting tsunami and the fragileness of the、uh, trip, uh, safety system. And the disaster response is very difficult. Uh, accompanying inevitable human errors, disruption of communication and evacuation. Just the recovery is very difficult. At the same time, we should、uh, see the so called examine a structural strength of NPP, nuclear power plant, and the importance of communication, I would like to stress. Finally,、uh, this is my、uh, tentative evaluation. There are, those are the、so、locations of nuclear power plant. Just to prevent us, we have to redesign contingency plans regarding rolling,、uh, rolling back,、uh, blackouts, 
metropolitan commuters or something like that. Or just some responses. The, right now, the crises are occurring simultaneously. So that how to assess, how to prioritize is very difficult. And when it comes to disaster recovery, a pile of uncertainties. Although actually I'm a cautious optimist, so that actually I am certain that Japan will recover. But fiscal strength of Japan's economy is a problematic. Isolation of global supply chain networks is also very difficult. And when, finally, when it comes to evaluation, we have to uh, we have to think seriously about just preparedness, implication of globalization, because information travels fast and forcefully like tsunami. So, so that for this reason, importance of communication, domestic and global, is very important. This is the picture, so that the, when you look at the picture like this, disaster management center, which are designed to stand against huge tsunami, but destroyed. And the, it is a really sad picture. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, now, Professor Michael Govey from MIT. Thank you. Um, I have much to cover, and so I decided to do this without the aid of a PowerPoint, uh, unaccustomed to, as I am to lecturing without it. Um, and I, I did come uh, prepared with one, and so if the questions go in the direction that we uh, could use them, I'll do that. But uh, what I want to do is uh, build on the comments of Mr. Kurihara, and um, I'm assuming that everyone is, who's here is sufficiently motivated that you've been paying attention to the television images and the stories, and so I'll build on that as well. And I'll, I'll try to um, uh, draw attention to some of the important elements of what we need to think about uh, for this incident and the implications for the future. Um, as uh, Mr. Kurihara has already noted, uh, this was a very big earthquake. Um, uh, by some estimates, the fifth strongest in terms of energy release in recorded human history, um, and also by some indications, uh, one that uh, was not precedented in Japan until about 1,200 years ago. So one of the important things to note in thinking about this is how rare this event is. Um, I was asked, I've been interviewed a gazillion times in the past week, and I was asked what was the biggest surprise in all of this, and uh, after thinking for a moment, I said the biggest surprise was actually the occurrence of this earthquake. I had never thought that an event like that would happen during my lifetime, but it has. And you know, rare events happen, but uh, nonetheless, it's a it's a surprise. To put it into context, um, if we look at uh, the standards to which nuclear power plants are designed uh, for shaking, for ground motion. It had an energy le release, um, we think, roughly 100 times uh, what is a typical um, upper limit uh, earthquake. Uh, this would apply for, say, the Diablo Canyon plant, which is uh, on the Pacific coast uh, in California, sited uh, near a known fault. Uh, but So that will give you uh, some idea. And as uh, Mr. Kurihara has already noted, there, it was accompanied by a very large uh, tsunami, which accounted for a lot of damage. The, as far as the nuclear power plant is concerned, um, the occurrence of the earthquake uh, triggered an automatic shutdown of the three reactors which were operating. This is standard procedure, and uh, that part worked very well. In terms of the ground motion and shaking, um, the reports uh, so far appear to indicate that um, the plants uh, were less damaged by the ground motion than they were by the subsequent tsunami, which if you've visited Japan and seen uh, their practices with uh, civil structures, this may not be such a big surprise, because one of the things that you note is that their civil structures in general are quite beefy. Now, the opportunities to sound like an idiot when I discuss this are abundant, because the amount of information that's actually been made available concerning what's actually happened at the site is very small compared to what you need to make confident statements. So what I'm really doing is giving you my interpretation of what's been uh, said, and all, I'm sure that things that I'm saying will turn out to be wrong. So you know, bear that in mind. Caveat emptor. Um, okay. 
what happened was first to note, if you uh, were, were uh, paying really careful attention to the uh, previous slides, you will note that this power plant site has a large number of uh, reactors at it. Um, it has six operating reactors, or had six operating reactors. Um, there is a site at Kashiwazaki that has seven, but the Japanese style has been to crowd reactors into single sites, reflecting the difficulties that they have in siting large industrial projects generally, and their practice is more to do this than you find in other countries. To give you an idea, in the United States, uh, the largest plant has uh, three units, um, in Canada, there's one site that has eight, but the total power being produced is lower than you would find at the Japanese sites. Uh, and having uh, this large number of facilities exacerbated the difficulty of responding uh, to this event because they were all affected by the earthquake and by the tsunami. So that the crew at the site, in deciding what to respond to, had actually a very difficult time in simply uh, knowing where to respond and how. Uh, in addition to the six reactors, there were six spent fuel storage pools which contained uh, nuclear fuel. There's one common spent fuel storage pool containing somewhat uh, older, less, less radioactive nuclear fuel. There were, uh, or are still, 13 backup emergency diesel generators, all of which were taken out of action. Uh, the story that's been, that I've put together on this is that uh, they may have been damaged by the initial ground shaking, but it's the tsunami uh, which, um, uh, by some reports, damaged the generators themselves. More importantly, took out the fuel supply, which may have also been damaged by the uh, ground shaking, uh, and flooded areas uh, where essential switchgear is located. And I go into this detail to give you uh, a hint of the number of things that the people at the site had to deal with in thinking about how to respond to this. It's a very complex situation. Uh, and it's very easy in hindsight, I, I think, to uh, underestimate uh, the difficulty of what they were facing. Uh, to, to compound this, when, when the backup power sources were taken out, and they also had lost the grid, th this is um, a loss of all um, AC power event. In nuclear speak, this is called a station blackout event. It's a well-recognized uh, hazard, and plants are designed against it. Um, for example, I give a course on probability and risk at MIT, and in the first uh, lecture this semester, uh, I included the event tree for the station blackout event. It's uh, something that's, that's anticipated. It's very hard to deal with when it occurs in multiple versions. Um, but it's, it's not something that, that people have been clueless about. That's the main thing that I want you to take away concerning that. And, and there are efforts to anticipate it. But this was all, also a situation where what happened was far beyond the design basis for the individual units and for the site in combination. Okay. Following the, the uh, earthquake, the plants were shut down, so the problems for the neutron chain reaction were eliminated, uh, roughly, yeah, completely. And the big problem was that of cooling the reactor. That is, once you start up a nuclear reactor, you can never shut it down. And what this means is that there are fission products created in the reactor fuel, which are residues from the fission reaction, which is the nuclear reaction by which you get the heat that provides the electricity. Those fission products will remain radioactive forever. Sometimes you hear about plutonium-239 having a half-life of 25,000 years, and it re remains radioactive for that amount of time. Well, that's nonsense. It remains radioactive forever. It's only a question of the rate of decay, and that's true with the various fission products. So the, the problem is you have a perfect heat source, and you have imperfect cooling systems. And that's why you have redundancy. You try to make them as reliable as you can. They, in the designs of all the nuclear power plants in the world today, except one, which is located in China, rely on AC power for this. And so when you lose AC power, you, you lose an essential function, and it touched everything in sight. In addition, they lost their sight. That is, they were literally in the dark, without lights, without instruments. And so whatever damage had occurred, and whatever was the status of the plant, was not well known to the, to the plant operators. That condition only 
was alleviated completely yesterday. The, um, the state of contamination of the plant is only now still poorly known. And one of the things that the people involved have to be doing is trying to figure out what is the situation and what are the possible actions. Um, there has clearly been fuel damage at the various units. This is the way that you create a nuclear emergency. You basically overheat the fuel. You have chemical reactions that produce hydrogen and release some of the fission products from the nuclear fuel. And uh, by off-site measurements, we know that this has happened. What we don't know is the degree to which it's occurred. Um, and just to give you an idea of this, the fission products come out in the form of noble gases, mo mostly xenon and krypton. Uh, volatile fission products, which are those of greatest concern, these will be isotopes of cesium, strontium, iodine, and then non-volatile fission products, which, which stay put in the nuclear fuel and only get out if the fuel itself gets out, which is not likely, I'd say. After that, doses are delivered according to where the fission products are born by the wind and rain. I last want to turn to uh, what the future, uh, questions for the future. Um, immediately, there's the question of how to stabilize the plant. And in interviews for the past week, I've been telling people to watch for when electricity comes back. That began on Friday, and the reports say that it was completed yesterday. This is essential for stabilization, and the frequency of reporters' phone calls has been going down, which indicates that it can be happening. Um, following that will be the problem of cleanup. This is parallel to what happened after Three Mile Island. You've got a huge contamination problem. You can expect this to go on for more than a decade to consume much more money than anybody's thinking about spending on it right, right now, um, and it'll be a continuing story. There will doubtless also be post-mortem internationally in Japan and the United States, and these questions will concern what to do about direct seismic-related effects, of course, uh, including tsunamis, how to set design limits for severe threats, whether we really want to get serious about actually disposing of nuclear waste rather than using it as, a, as an entertainment at cocktail parties and uh, in left-leaning leading pressure groups. Um, to what degree we will require passive safety systems as opposed to relying on active systems that, that need such things as electricity. And finally, what our future energy policies will be concerning the portfolio of technological, uh, our technological mix. And that's everything that I have to say. Osaka, it's about 600 kilometers away from the damaged area. So we have actually no impact from the tsunami and the earthquake. But the, I'm from the Kansai University. The Kansai area contains Kyoto, Osaka, Kobe, and Nara. The, you remember in 1995, we have a huge earthquake in Kobe. And but the, my home times here, the, I was there yeah. until I was 18 years old. And the, fortunately, my family is uh, safe. And, and I have to mention this, the <coughs> cultures in North, East, and West, South is quite different in Japan. The North, East is the native rural Japanese culture, and South, West is some Asian taste added. And in Tokyo, Western taste added. <laughs> <laughs> and geographically, the, oh, two parts is different. We have these areas on the American plate, and this area on the Asian plate, it is, I think it's a coincidence, but the next topic is, how is the Japanese public reacting to the tragedy? I divide the two parts of the area. The one part is the people in the severely damaged area. The most, Severe impact is insufficient communication with outside. Communication facilities are wiped out or broken, 
and no e electricity supply, and roads, lanes, seaports, and airports did not work. So they had no food, no medicines, no oils to heat, very cold. An um, uh, Asian man died because of the cold. And the vehicles without gas, so they can't drive away. And the local governments were wiped out, literally wiped out. No town hall or city halls there, and the, no mayors. Mayors himself died, and the, none knew the statistics. The, even now, we don't know the average number of the people passed away and missing and the evacuated. And the second part area is the people in the severely damaged, mm, oh, and, 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 and the people in the severely damaged area thinks they can nothing but to endure. The, especially in the rural, seashore, and the mountainous areas. That is because they had little efficacy. And they could not identify the situation because no, they, they have no, because they have no information. And second areas, people in the outside of this area, like Osaka, and uh, there was nothing we could do for the victims. Because <coughs> there was no route to reach the most severely damaged villages. Getting better. And the, uh, there is very limited amount of gas in this region, uh, means the damaged air regions. So they can't drive. And even if we blow something there, there would be no gas to return. And the, actually, one of my colleagues tried to get in, but he couldn't. And the second area is the people who are under the impact of the disaster. For example, Tokyo. The, they suffer from the inception electricity supply and the decreased number of public transportations and the fear of radiations. And the, most of the people there believe we have to endure, endure. We have to no rights to complain because people in the disaster area are suffering more severely than us. And the, why we Japanese think like this? I have three hypotheses. One hypothesis is equality-oriented culture we have. The, everyone should be the same as me. The, we tend to look down the leaders. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have a Japanese senator here. And the, uh, but we follow the others. Others are the leader for us Japanese. And we believe that behaving ourselves like others will bring us happiness. So in the central damage area, the, it seems others accept this situation. So I should accept it. And in the peripheral damage area, as I said, they have suffered more severely than us. We should be equal. Then we have no rights to complain. Um, next hypothesis is the victims have not yet come to the phase of reality perception. The victim says, I feel as if I were in my dream. The victims have no more energy but to survive without burdening the others with oneself. 
And I believe the real grief would come later. And the third hypothesis is the, we have a strong sense of unity with nature. I think it's the, the same as the Native American had. The, we have to accept the nature did because we are part of nature. What earthquake and the tsunami did, uh, humans' activities come back to the nature. That's all. And the next topic, how the Japanese perceive the ongoing nuclear power plant crisis. The first, we are angry and disgusted at Tokyo Electric Power Company and the national government. They seem powerless and very bad at to react to the disaster. But basically, we Japanese have phobia about radiation. One example is this. And the, but we can't go back to the past. What happening is what happening. We have to accept it. The also it is repeatedly informed us that the impact on the radiation so far has little effect on our health. And this is absolutely right, scientifically. So we are trying to believe that we are safe. And actually, everyone is making an effort to avoid radiation. Okay. But I have to told you this. What really serious is, the side effects know the information. Unrealistic overreaction will suffer the Fukushima people. One damages, economic damages. In Fukushima area, many farmers there, they produce milk and vegetables. If they can sell their products, they suffer economically. And second is discrimination. Example is this. You should not marry a girl from the Fukushima area because of the future baby. That is nonsense. Nonsense, but all the people in the world believe it. It brings them a discrimination. And the third, the, the how should and the can we recover from it? I have no idea. <laughs> totally no idea. Because I think the, this disaster still remains phase one. Uh, phase one is the undergo ongoing impact. In a common disaster, the phase one lasts only a couple of days. The nearly two weeks passed, but in this crisis, phase one is continues because you know, the insufficient statistics and the nuclear power plant is actually ongoing. I think that's all. Thank you. Very much. So this is certainly not uh, the worst event that we have seen even in our own lifetimes in terms of lives lost. Uh, a year ago, we were all Haitians uh, in an event that killed 250,000 people. Uh, so uh, we need to understand this as a huge <coughs> physical event, but uh, many uh, fewer lives lost than one might have expected. And that is my first big message, which is that one of the things to bear in mind is the enormous success of the Japanese preparations in advance of this event uh, and of the response during this event. Uh, don't miss that as the big picture. The big picture is that there were tens 
and tens of thousands of lives that were spared as a result of the excellent work that had been done in the past to develop building codes to make sure they were enforced and to train people about tsunamis uh, to move to higher ground. And so we need to, to recognize this as a situation in which, in spite of an historic-sized seismic event, buildings did not fall down. Uh, thousands of people did not die in buildings collapsing. Uh, and people understood what they were supposed to do in tsunamis, and many, many thousands of them escaped as a result. Now, the, the losses are still terrible, and they will be, as Rudy Giuliani said after September 11th, the losses, when we find out what they are, will be more than we can bear. But we will bear them. And that, I think, is exactly what we are seeing in, in Japan today. So there are many people who can speak to the nature of this event in more specific detail about the particular aspects of it. But the general form of this is fairly uh, clear, and we've seen it before. In a large seismic event, an offshore seismic event creates a tsunami. So you have a seismic event plus a tsunami. And that leads to a series of failures of complex systems that are affected by it. And that's what we're witnessing. That's what we've seen, and that's what we're continuing to witness with the attempts to stabilize the nuclear power plants and with the enormous destruction to the transit systems and to all the other support systems, the electric grid, all the other support systems that make life in modern times what it actually is and which will take a while to rebuild. So what we've seen is a cascading event uh, where the damage began in one form and uh, has created multiple points of, of damage and failure in very complex systems. Uh, we saw large-scale large, large fires, which is common in the, in the event of earthquakes. Uh, we saw, we've seen a significant damage to nuclear power facilities and to the transport system, all of which will make it di more difficult uh, for the society to regather itself and reconstruct and rebuild. Uh, nonetheless, I think we have to say, uh, we can go into more detail about exactly what's happening in the, in the power plants, and Professor Goulet has already uh, done, uh, given us a great summary of that. The one thing I, I would add to that is that what we are witnessing is a system that is operating well beyond its design limits uh, because it's an historic event, an event of a thousand year recurrence. You can't plan on events that are a thousand year recurrence. It rarely makes sense uh, to try to build systems that are, are structured for that uh, infrequent an event. And as a result, we have to be ready to cope when we go beyond the design limits. Again, viewed that way, uh, the nuclear power plants are, relatively speaking, a success. We have not had a really significant breach of containment so far, it appears, and a release of very high level radioactivity, which one could imagine having. And the systems, in spite of operating past their design limits, uh, have so far maintained a, a higher, I think, than expected level of integrity. Not, it's not perfect, and it's not pretty. Uh, there's going to be a great deal of cleanup, as Professor Goulet observed. Uh, but uh, given that what we've seen is that we are, in effect, having to rely on a combination of design and we're past the design limits and improvisation. Uh, improvisation is always a messy business, and uh, it's both, uh, on the one hand, essential, but on the other hand, uh, difficult and risky. And so uh, I think that's why you're seeing the Japanese people also rallying around the people who are uh, trying to get control uh, at the ground level in those, in those nuclear power plants. Let me make just a few comments about the response that we've seen and, and then what we're going to see going forward. Uh, on the response side, the thing to recognize is that in very large complex events of this form, the systems that work best are systems that are highly decentralized. Because a centralized system is overburdened by trying to figure out too many different things that happen in too many different places. So what you want is a system that can operate on a decentralized basis. But that's also extremely difficult in an event like this because the most decentralized points are also the ones in which the greatest damage occurred. Uh, they're the small villages, the remote villages that we've already spoken about in the northeastern part of Japan, where the capacity was the capacity to respond was decimated at the same moment that the need for that capacity was created. And so that is what you're seeing people struggling with, and you'll continue to see that. Uh, so that's a, a, a part of what uh, what we're, at least my interpretation of what we're living through. The other thing that we're going to continue to see is that the impact of events like this is multiple forms of damage to complex systems, which makes them difficult to get back together and to, uh, to, to rebuild and to, to get them to function as effectively as, as one would like. Um, so at, again, at the time when we most need the capacity, the capacity is itself degraded. Uh, the one thing we should notice about that is, as a, as a general lesson to all of us, is that we are more vulnerable to system failures than we often imagine. 
because we mostly see our systems functioning pretty well. Uh, when we see this kind of level of damage to multiple systems at the same time, we discover a greater vulnerability than we realized we had. But I predict the following. I predict that we're also going to discover that there's a greater degree of resilience and ingenuity than we would ordinarily predict. Because if we tried to think of how you would fix these things, we wouldn't be able to do it. But Japan has enormous resources, and the world will also contribute resources, to trying to figure out how to get those systems back online and back together as quickly as possible. And the level of ingenuity that you see in circumstances like this is us at our best. And that I think we're, we're seeing already in Japan, and we're going to see much more of that. So in spite of the fact that there's enormous damage and damage to complex systems that are difficult to rebuild, if we tried to imagine ourselves what it would take to rebuild them and to make predictions about that, we would be far off because the people who are close to those systems and, and uh, know how they operate are going to move in, are moving in very quickly, and they will be more ingenious than we would predict and more effective than, than, uh, than, than we would otherwise imagine. So finally, I want to uh, turn to what we're going to see going out into the, the future. Uh, we are hopefully in the process of the last round of the stabilization of the ongoing event at the nuclear power plants and moving into the long, very long uh, recovery phase. This is a story that will all be about resilience. It will be about the resilience of the uh, Japanese people and of their culture and of their uh, engineering ingenuity. Uh, the Japanese are famously a highly resilient uh, people and culture. This runs very deep. Uh, there is a, a form of acceptance in Japan, but that we shouldn't understand it as just sort of whatever happens, we'll, we'll deal with it. It's acceptance without defeat, I think, is the important aspect of this. It's acceptance, but with the spirit of picking us up and moving forward. And that, I think, is what we're already seeing and what we're going to see more of. This is bearing whatever the burden is but bearing it with dignity and moving on and uh, continuing. And I think we're all going to learn a lot from watching as the Japanese people regather themselves and move forward. Uh, the one thing I would also comment on, as Professor Shuti has, has mentioned, is the importance of not ignoring post-traumatic stress. There are enormous psychological burdens from uh, events of this form. And that's a really important thing not to assume everybody's supposed to deal with that on their own or that we can ignore it or that uh, people can find help, but to really address that in a very direct way. Uh, and this is a common feature of very large-scale events, and it is a, an a, often undiagnosed epidemic in the post-disaster period and something that I think it's important to pay attention to. So the final question I'll, I'll turn to just very briefly because I'm about to have the microphone pulled away from my hand is uh, what implications does this have for risks run by others in other locations? What you know, should people in the U.S. or elsewhere learn uh, from this event? Should we be all frightened about our nuclear power plants and earthquakes and so on? Well, in, in, on January 26th of the year 1700, there was the mirror image of the event that we just saw in Japan. There was a very large earthquake off the west coast of the United States and the Cascadia Fault off of the coastline of Washington. This caused a tsunami in Japan uh, which was noticed, that's how we know what date it happened, because it's in the historical record in Japan. Uh, and it was exactly the opposite of the event here. It was about a 9.0 level seismic event, a, a tsunami that crossed the ocean. The reason the Japanese noted it was that they did not feel the earthquake, but they had the tsunami, and that was unusual to them. Uh, so they made a special note of it, a little footnote in history there. Uh, so these events do happen in other places. Uh, there, another one will happen on our west coast. You could, if you just think a little bit about the size of the tsunami that was generated by this event, and the proximity of Seattle, Tacoma, Vancouver, and Victoria to the fault line that I just described off the coast of Washington, uh, you have to imagine this is an event that can happen elsewhere as well. Probably, almost surely not within our lifetimes. It's a long recurrence event. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, that, that event is out there at some point for us. So yes, those risks uh, exist. Uh, so we also need to be vigilant about our mitigation efforts, uh, building buildings, uh, building uh, retaining walls, and so on. Uh, making sure our systems are up out of uh, water's reach. Um, but I don't think we ought suddenly, in the face of what we're seeing in Japan, to feel radically differently about nuclear power than we have felt in the past. Uh, this, again, is a very long uh, period recurrence event. Uh, the uh, plants are actually operating, since they're past their design limits, they're ap actually operating uh, more or less as they are designed to do in containing this event. And so I think uh, we should be looking to build a decentralized and effective response. That's part of our work that we've been doing at the Program on Crisis Leadership and drawing other lessons from this. Uh, but to me, I think the most powerful lesson will be from watching the Japanese people 
and their process of resilience. And that, I think, is a great, going to be a great lesson for all of us. Thank you.